Welcome to Vectorworks 2B, Lesson 3A. This is a quick demonstration of some of the more advanced 3D techniques. I'm your guest lecturer, James Russell. Jumping right in today's lesson, we're going to do is discuss some of the more advanced 3D techniques that you'll need to create some of those curved and illustrious objects in Vectorworks, the troublesome ones as we call them. I'm going to kick things right off the bat with extrude along a path and uh, this is pretty simple to get your head around but using it uh, appropriately is often difficult. So here I'm just going to draw a couple of these objects here and let's just say that we're going to bend a piece of wire along both of these paths and this is a circular piece of wire so I'm just quickly going to draw a cross section of it and I'm just going to say it's perhaps 15mm radius, that looks pretty good to me there. So this is a cross section of our piece of wire and these are the two paths here so I'm just going to duplicate this to here so we can see. Straight off, selecting both of these from the model menu here, choose extrude along a path. And you'll notice when I click on this we get this dialog box popping up and it asks us here basically what is the path object. So the path is what you want to follow. And it's highlighted here in red, you can use these buttons here to choose and also whether it's a uniform scale, meaning that this is the same size all the way along, or is it an exponential scale, growing from this to a certain amount of times its size. So if we put 50 in here, it would start off at this size, and by the time it got to the end of the path, it would be 50 times larger. Also some path and profile paint, plain stuff here. We'll just click OK, and you can see it's extruded that along the path. Now just to exaggerate that a bit more, here we've got a bit more of a radical path going on. Choosing here, extrude along a path again from the model menu. Choosing the path, which is already highlighted here in red, and clicking OK. You can see it's taken this object and done along a path. Now, you can also see these are now 3D objects. If I render them, you'll also see that this is actually a fully 3D object. Now, that means that your path can also be a 3D NURBS curve, if you like. So if you want to follow something not only in the X and Y plane, but also in the Z plane, you can do that as well. Moving right along, we're going to jump straight on to the tapered extrude. It's something that you won't normally use. The only time I really use it is for table legs. So here I've just drawn average box completely. And uh, let's just say this was a table leg. I'd go here to the model menu, a tapered extrude. The Z height, now normally I'll just kill two birds with one stone and say that it's maybe negative 500. So my table's 500 high. In the negative direction, that means the leg goes downwards and a taper angle of, let's say, 10 degrees. No, 5 degrees is going to be OK. So if I click OK here, you can see it's made a slight change in the shape. But if I look at that in a front view, now it's not very exaggerated here because 500 was a bad choice. But you can see it's got a slight angle to it. Perhaps if I was to change this height to an exaggerated figure of negative 5,000, for example, we'd be able to see the taper quite clearly here on this object. So that's the tapered extrude. Obviously it goes upwards and the angle can be changed. So if I wanted slightly less, I could type in 3 degrees. And if I wanted slightly more, I might go for 7 or something like that. Obviously this is the peak that I can go to. Continuing along this line, we're going to discuss sweep. And sweep was one of the functions we probably discussed last year. But uh, if you need a reminder of it, here's a circular object. And what I'm going to do is just show you the sweep command straight off the bat here. So if I go drop down from the model menu to sweep, and just using the default commands, I'll run through these in a second, but just clicking OK creates a donut object. Now what it's actually doing here is taking our circular object and choosing a point, in this case the far left hand side, and it's actually spinning this object around. So if you have a look at a 3D view, it's created a donut for us here in this 3D plane, choosing this point here and taking this circular object and running it round and round several times. So I'm just going to do this, and I'm going to create a custom object here, for example, the triangle tool, which I don't know if you guys actually have here. Into the three sides. Sure, sounds great. I want to go this way. And if you watch, if I do it with the triangle again, just to emphasize what's going on, because the circle is often hard to follow, clicking sweep and choosing the default, it's taken that object, and here in the front view, it's taken it all the way around itself, and here it is in the side view, just there. Oh, sorry, in the isometric view. Now this can be handy as well when creating a couple of other objects. Uh, wine glasses is a typical example. And I'm just going to quickly sketch one as quickly as I can. And what you want to remember most of the time when you're doing these is that you want to only draw half an object. 
I'll show you what I mean by that in a moment. using my U key here to flick through. I probably should change that point there to a straight end point, as you can see. I'm also going to use my snap, so I get that smack bang on onto there. And just because we're going to try and be a little bit fancy here, I'm also going to do the inside recess of the cup here, or the glass I should say. Just taking a little stab here in the dark at this one. You can see I'm constantly zooming in and out to try and get these curves to be as accurate as possible. I know we're just doing a quick example, but it doesn't hurt to try and be as accurate as possible. And I'm extending this one beyond the boundary, mainly so I can come back up here and reapproach it this one like so. So now I've got a profile of what I'm going to call the wine glass. I grab this and just using even the basic sweep mode and click OK, you can see I create another 3D object such as this, rendered there. I'm just going to flip it on its side as well there. And there you go. So that's pretty good. Good example of the sweep function. Obviously you can put a glass texture on there. If I've got one in here available to me, I'll throw it on quickly. Glass clear sounds great. There it is without a background. That's a bit better, isn't it? So you can see in you know a couple of a couple of minutes there, I created what is really quite a nice three D rendering of that glass. Now that was slightly off topic, and obviously we'll discuss a few more of those things that I've just done. But just jumping back to the sweep object, one important thing to note is what you can do apart from having it locked on the default settings where it rotates normally by the center left of an object. You can also use this, which is the loci tool and place a loci anywhere, for example if I place one here and select both the objects before doing the sweep tool it'll choose this object here, the loci, as the central point which means it includes all of this distance and the circle in the rotation field so showing you that here, sweep, once again using the default settings here you can see what it's actually done is kept that the same radius out from this center point here, the loci, and spun that all the way around creating a larger donut handy things to know, especially when creating those objects such as vases, glasses, uh, jugs, anything like that. Now in class we quickly discussed the loft uh, tool, but just to run through it again, there's three functions up here, and I know we only briefly touched on the first, but I'll give you an overview of all three now. What I'm going to do, just as a basic start off here, is just draw a couple of polylines. Uh, so I'm just going to draw a straight one, for example, right here, and it's it's quite simple, it's just going to be a straight line, and we've also got this one here which is just going to be a little bit more of a fancy curl, there we go, excellent, like that. I'm going to select both of these and I'm also going to turn them into 3D objects, or 3D lines in this case, which are known as NURBS, and NURBS are just lines that follow a mathematical principle, but they're also shown up on the 3D plane, I'll see if I can find them here now, there they are. Now what I'm going to do is uh, grab this one here, and I'm also going to mirror it across this plane here. So there we go, I've got one on each side. Just grabbing this center one and looking at it in a right hand view, if I can track it down somewhere there. I'm just going to shift it up. So what we end up with is like a little TP essentially with those three lines. It doesn't quite show it there, but it's actually arcing up like that. 
So what the loft tool does is correlate all the points along here and plays a big game of join the dots with this one here, and then it's going to play a game of dots with this one here. So it's going to grab this end point, it's going to take that to there and take this down to here again. And then it's going to go along to the next point, say here, up to here, down to here. And it's just going to keep doing that over and over until it creates a surface out of them all the way to the end that in this case is going to look a little bit like a tent. So grabbing the loft surface, and you'll see all of that in a moment, on here, this is the loft with no rail. Essentially here, and you can see it's got little red lines that say, okay, you're going to make all of the major points for this, and I'm going to play join the dots. So clicking on this one, clicking on this one here, and clicking on this one here. Now it is important, the end choice, you'll notice I can press escape here, and actually choose a different end point. And that essentially tells you where it's going to play join the dots from first. So you can see I'm telling it to start here, go to here and go to here as opposed to starting at this end. There's no real difference in the endings, but obviously you don't want to go click to here, to here and to here because it won't know which end is which. Clicking the tick brings up the loft creation menu. Setting the curves is not really um, an issue because we've already got them all selected here. And there isn't a really an alignment issue because all these curves are the same length. Sometimes it will need to approximate that there. Now I can choose to create a solid, otherwise it will create a, uh, a plane between these, and a plane is just a, essentially a 2D polygon in the 3D world. Um, but uh, in this case I'm going to create a solid. I can keep the curves for later output, and also ruled. You can see a little bit here, but it's essentially is it straight or is it curved? And a closed is obviously does it loop back on itself. So I can click preview here, and you can see essentially really quickly, it's, it's just making all those lines meet up there several times over. If I click OK, there's our object, and I'm going to render that just so we can see it, and I know it's a little bit hard because it is a white object there, but essentially we've created a little little tent for ourselves. I might exaggerate that a little bit more, just by going back here, grabbing that central point somewhere here, dragging that quite a long way up. Now I might just for the demonstration purposes grab the loft surface again, choose these three points just to show you it's the same thing, it's just choosing the starting point, ticking the box, preview of that, you can see it's once again joined up all of these arcing lines between the surface, and now it'll look something like that, a little TP tent for us. Now I know some of you will already be getting ideas on how you can use this in your future drawings, so that's part one of that uh, tool. We're going to go through part two and three, and they're very similar. Let's plug it in. It's going to say, hey, I see you've plugged in a new device. And it's going to load in the appropriate drivers. You'll notice that this scanner build, whoa. <laughs> Moving that right must, along. That must, be, uh, that must be why we're not shipping Windows 98 Absolutely. Yet. <laughs> Absolutely. So I've spent nearly an hour thus far attempting to get either the loft with one rail mode or the braille sweep mode to work in 2012. And I'm at the point where I'm going to give up on that. Uh, I suggest that you stick to this one. This is my tried and true so far method of lofting. Uh, it is amazing and will work almost every time you do it. These two here, I have no idea. No idea why they will not work in 2012, but we're going to move on from there. So I'm just going to show you these two here, the fillet edge and the chamfer edge tool. Uh, they're really, really nifty and you guys who are designers who say that needs a slight chamfer to it or that needs you know such and such to it, you're just going to love these. So I'm just going to extrude this and make it into a plain old box. Sure, sounds great. There we go. So I've just drawn a box. It's just you know 11,000 by what, 13 and a half thousand or so. Uh, I'm actually going to have two of those. Is what I'm going to do. There's another one. There's another one. Excellent. Two boxes side by side. Now, as a little picture here shows, and I don't know if you can quite see that, but one's got a little curve, which is the fillet, and one's got the chamfer, which is just a cutoff. And they just do exactly what their little things here is say they do. You just come close to an edge, you can see it turns red, so I might choose this edge here and this edge here, for example. 
And up here, it's got either a tick or a pencil and spanner. So we know pencil and spanner means something more is hiding away here, and the tick means go ahead. Click on this, you can see here, there's a couple of options here. You can select faces, you can select all the edges, you can do everything. But the most important part here is the radius, and it's also indicated up here if you want a quick jump to it, this little 30. Now I'm going to choose around 2,000 as my radius here. That's actually, maybe I'll go 1,000. I want that to be about And if I click OK, nothing happens yet because I don't actually have the tick done. But if I click the tick, you can see it puts a curve on there. I'm going to do it to this edge as well. Might up that again to 2,000. There we go. Click OK. And you can see it just rounds that edge off. And having a look here in 3D, you can see it's actually made that into a fully rounded corner, much like the tiny image down here. Now obviously if you've cottoned onto that, you can see here if I select the chamfer, and I'm just going to leave it in 3D for this. Once again, it's got the setback option, there are more options here if you want. Clicking tick though, cuts the edge off. Do it again here, throw another number in there, maybe 3000, click the tick, cuts it off. And you can, can keep doing this as well, if I select this edge here and tick the box, it'll cut into that edge. If I then reselect this edge here and tick the box, it'll just keep cutting away and cutting away, obviously, until you approach something pretty close to this. But they're very handy tools to use, and if uh, at some stage in the future you get really pro at using them, let me know, because uh, I'm sure you can create some great things with them. You can already see that we're off to a great start cutting and slicing away here in different ways. So they're pretty much your advanced 3D tools. There are a few more here, such as Extract, Creating Contours and Project. All of those are great fun to play with. And the Shell, obviously. Shell Solids is another great one to play with. But for now, they're the ones that you might need for the remainder of these couple of lessons. I encourage you to have a look at these and have a read through the manual. And if anyone finds out how these other two loft modes work, love to hear about them. Hopefully now you feel a little more comfortable with some of the more advanced 3D techniques. Obviously there's hundreds more to go, but for now this is a good basis to get you going. The remainder of this lesson is completed with classwork. If you are not in class, feel free to move on to lesson 4A.